This is Sagar Patel, and you're watching the Matt Valiker Podcast. Hello, fine folks. Thank you for tuning in to the Matt Valiker Podcast. Please do me a favor and like, subscribe, and share with 3 to 17 of your closest pals. You are in for a treat, folks, because today's guest and Clay Thompson are the biggest studs to graduate from Rancho Center and Margarita High School. This gentleman's career includes impactful roles at IBM, Boston Scientific, and Carl Storrs Endoscopy. He's the founder and managing director of OceanCom Advisory Group. Please welcome Sagar Patel to the program. How are you doing, Sagar? Great, brother. So great to see you as always. And um, it's a pleasure and a privilege being on here. A pleasure. It's a pleasure and a privilege to look at that hair. Like, I, I mean, before we get into it, like what, what is your, your, your hair routine, Sagar? Because this looks beautiful. <laughs> no, man, I'm just lucky and be blessed to, you know, have hair at our ripe age of 40, you know, but so um... it, it's natural. It's not a wig. Well, <laughs> I, I've known Sagar for, for a long time, but this is this will be interesting because there's plenty I I don't know about you. I mean, we uh, we were friends and, and uh, classmates at business school, but obviously your first job wasn't at USC Marshall. What was your first job, Sagar? So actually, most people don't know this, but my first job was uh, an engineer for Boston Scientific, and so there's a story behind all that. But yeah, first Wait, so, job was engineering. so like. You didn't have any like paper routes. You didn't like flip burgers. They're like <laughs> your intro to the working world. Was, was well, let's take, you're so funny. Let's take a step back. So um, I, I'm actually the first born here in America out of my entire extended family. So my father's youngest of six, mother's youngest of six, uh, immigrated here from India. Um, if Patel didn't give it, give it away for you. <laughs> and um, basically... You know, growing up, uh, born in Chicago, but raised here in uh, Southern California, I had kind of a very unique upbringing because on one end, I grew up in OC in the 80s and 90s when they didn't really know if I was red dot or feather. You know, it was <laughs> one of the only brown people in all my you know, elementary school, <laughs> high school at Santa Margarita. I, I read uh, about you during the Thanksgiving story. <laughs> exactly. Um, but then on the flip side, uh, my father being very, you know, blue collar upbringing, um, and really Chicago matched his kind of his pers persona um, in the States. He brought that Chicago vibe in our household and that Indian culture and mentality. And so I was raised speaking, you know, three languages. And now I speak four, I guess, tres y media, if you count Spanish. <laughs> but I spoke, you know, Gujarati um, as fluently as English. That's all we spoke at home. And then I actually learned Hindi growing up from watching Bollywood because as a child in the 80s, when you don't have a choice on a Friday, Saturday night of what you can do, and your parents are making you watch the latest Bollywood movie with on VHS and those subtitles, you're a sponge and you end up picking it up. So I speak Hindi, Gujarati, and English. And so I lived very, like, you know, very two polarized kind of uh, worlds. You know, one is, you know, South OC um, and very lucky to be, you know, called an, you know, to be an American. And on the other hand, I was very, uh, you know, just blessed and privileged to, be raised with like Indian culture and, sure. you know, be given access to that, you know? So how many like Indian weddings have you been a guest at? Oh my goodness. Too many to count brother. I mean, okay. I'm actually, I'm actually flying to one tomorrow to Orlando. <laughs> and how, <laughs> how many days will this wedding be? So this one in Orlando is going to be four days. It starts today, which I'm missing. And then I'll be there for tomorrow night's event, Friday night and Saturday night. It's a celebration. It's a, I have a very important podcast to do. I'll be there for the rest of the <laughs> 72 hours or whatever it is. Uh, well, that's kind of like, we have a similar story. Like like my mom's an immigrant, actually started in Chicago and then eventually it landed in California. But your story is a little more accelerated. Like, do you remember much from Chicago or, or what? Like, when, no, when did so, you move to OC? Yeah, so I was less than two when we moved to Orange County. So oh. I basically raised here. The only real tie I have is that my dad brainwashed me being, being a Bulls, Bears, and White Sox fan. <laughs> um, to, to this day, you know, Chicago is my sports town. Um, but no, man, I was raised in OC. Uh, very lucky. And um, I mean, you know, we all during our generation, man, I mean, people get so sensitive about it. But, you know, I was bullied, picked on. You know, we don't look like everybody else. They sometimes, you know, uh, kids don't know any better. But I'm so lucky because my parents had such a good 
um, just mindset where they taught me the balance of, hey, you know, don't don't take crap from anybody. But on the other side, they're like, never consider yourself a victim. You're very lucky to be in America. And so I was just happy to be here. And what they would do is every three to four years, we would go to India. So I've been to India 10 times, but eight of those 10 times were in the first 20 years of my life from 83 to 2002. And so they took me to India every four years or so to humble me and to keep me connected to my grandparents at the time who used to be around all my cousins and then also to make you know sure that I see how lucky I am to be brought up in America. So I was just again like anything I had, I was just grateful for because you see such like opposite ends of the spectrum. And you know my family, we come from nothing. So every time we would go there, we we're rolling our sleeves up, and my sister and I were having a great time. You know, just making the most of every trip. So it really humbled us from day one. Yeah, that that's interesting because sometimes people won't go on trips as like a vacation like i want to see disney world or you know, i'm going to go see shamu you know it's, it's more like these ex exciting kind of once in a lifetime sort of things when you were going to india how did your parents bill it was it like you were going to see family or or did you know that they, they quote unquote wanted to humble you no oh, it was all, all the above i mean it was like hey we're going to india we're going to go see your cousins your uncles aunts your your grandparents and you better not complain <laughs> And, and the <laughs> ironic thing was my sister, my younger sister and I, we loved it, man. Like I used to sneak out and eat like street food and most American born Indians, they actually call it ABCD back in the day, like American born confused Desi. Um, people would think <laughs> that. And when I would go to the, you know, the streets with my cousins and they would start talking in Guju, they would assume just look, be looking at me that, oh, this kid doesn't know anything. He's probably from America. And then I'd start speaking in Guju and they were like shocked because all we spoke at home was Guju. So my Guju is as good as my English. And um, my sister and I, we like embraced it and ate it all up. Like we loved like lit staying with our cousins and like two bedroom houses, with, like 12 of us. And like our cousins treated us, you know, like with so much love that that's really what built our foundation and the core of who we are and that humility. Mm -hmm. And just um, again, like we weren't allowed to typically eat out because you'd get sick. And most of my peers born in America get sick. Man, I believe, <laughs> I'm, I to this day, I can really believe that my immune system is because of those trips to India, because my cousin would sneak me out and I'll eat street food to this day. I can eat street food anywhere, knock on wood, and <laughs> and literally, you know, be totally fine, you know? So the the GI tract of a champion, folks. Sagar <laughs> Patel. Uh, yeah, so it, it's like you you go there and you have so much fun. And then when you come back to California, do you immediately want to go back? Or is it like, oh, I'm so glad we have this year? Like, like, can you compare and contrast? That? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Actually, it's both. And so, A, you're kissing the ground when you get back. You're like, oh, I want my Taco Bell or whatever at the time we could afford. <laughs> but then also, you're you're also looking forward to that next trip because, you know, I didn't have the, the privilege of having my grandparents, you know, with me all the time in my home like a lot of kids do. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so we would always look forward to going back to India. Um, but it was, it was both, man. It's like, you're grateful to be in America, but you also have ties to India. And so, yeah, it was just a great, honestly, upbringing. The other thing that made my kind of situation unique, maybe not, maybe so, I don't know, you tell me, it was just, both of my parents were very different. Did you ever see that 70s show back in the day? Yeah, yeah. My parents are like a Gujarati Bollywood version of Red and Kitty, in, in the sense that my dad is super tough love, like nothing is good enough. If I got an A, what, you can't get an A+. plus. I scored 20 <laughs> points, but you can't score 30 like Jordan. And so like, and then meanwhile, my mother, Ramila, bless her heart, she would do the opposite and just shower me with so much like love and nurturing and almost like kind of raising me like a mama's boy growing up. So I had like these two different worlds where if I ever got made fun of, my dad would be like, hey, what's wrong with you? You're a man. Your job is to provide and protect. Why do you cry? You know? And then my mother would be like, hey, it's okay. It's all about being a good person. And you know, like you're funny. It'll pay off someday. <laughs> so it was, it was, uh, but that tough love that my dad raised me with is that muscle. I think that helped me build that like mental toughness and that growth mindset that I've literally carried out through my entire life that you don't realize you have that. And when it comes easy later in life, you assume everybody has it. But then now as I get older, I realize no, 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 like this is something that I'm very lucky and, you know, blessed to have, but it's because I've been building this muscle or this wiring, right? Because mm -hmm. there's certain skills that are coachable that, you can teach somebody and they can read a book and learn it in two, three months. And there's other qualities that you're wired with, right? And wiring takes an entire like lifetime to 
develop, right? And so if you want to unwire or rewire yourself, those things take years to like develop and, and improve on. And so that's one of the things that I was hardwired with, which was that being raised on tough love, that Jordan Colby mentality of someone says, you suck, you're dumb, you're da da da. I'm like, all right, I'm going to show you. Not, you know, you know what I mean? Not like nowadays where a lot of times like people get like, oh, really? I suck. And then like they fold and it's like, no, no, no. Like, <laughs> use that as right. like, yeah. yeah, you got to use that to your advantage. Well, it's like the classic exa example of tough love, but then a nurturing parent, like the, the, the benefits of having two. And obviously your dad loves you too, but just, you know, as humans, we show it in different ways. You you can't have too much of one thing and you're, you're the perfect balance of both Sagar. This is, this is fantastic. So, I try, I don't you, know have these, you know, amazing parents, a fairly unique upbringing. Uh, obviously you have a strong work ethic. Where does that come from? Again, my parents, they, my father, I think he had to borrow money starting in maybe high school for sure in college. He came here when he was 23. He got his master's in India and then had to get it again here just to come to America. So when we get here, it was on a student visa. So like he's always been a hard worker at work. You know, anything he wants, anything he does, he takes pride in. He's, you know, we would clean the garage, we would mow the lawn. It's like everything's perfect. It's like that's the mentality I was raised around was that you do anything, you take pride in it, whether it's household chore or if it's business or whatever and so combing your hair for instance <laughs> combing my hair i guess he actually i got that from him so i'm gonna i'm gonna throw that one at him too um and so the same thing with my mother you know she was a hard worker and every little thing she did um, whether it was being a stay-at-home mom or when she started working part-time when we were old enough uh to you know go to school and watch each other my sister and i so um that work ethic comes you know directly from my family and most of my extended family too are just hard workers you know like no excuses no victim mentality. You come to this country um, and you don't have the same amount of opportunities, and then you go find it. You don't make excuses. You you make the most out of it. And that, I think that hustlers like mentality is also something that's always given me that business mindset. Mm -hmm. And so in my career, like whether it's business or whether it's sales and generating revenue, it's that it, it's about tr not just trying, but like putting in that hard work and then wanting to do better and better and keep building on it, right? Not being satisfied. So yeah, that's something that was kind of instilled in me at a young age. I like that you brought up not being satisfied because on one hand, it's like you're always going to be short. You know, you're, you're, you're never going to achieve like, like now that you've been working for a while, just living a while, what has your attitude changed on that? Or talk to us about that. Oh, that's such an interesting question. So it's, it's evolved it's still a huge part of me. If anything, that chip is still there. And if, if anything, it gets bigger and bigger, but I think the goals change and then the mountains you climb up change. Right. So, um, one of the big things turning 40 last summer, I started asking myself a question. So like, what's my purpose? What's my purpose? Right. Because now money's really not the currency. It's time. Time is the currency. So that's where sure you're, you're, mountain top that you're trying to climb on and, and the goals you set are different, but that, that hustle, that like mindset of growing and, and improving and becoming better and better at whatever phase that is, whether it's business, physical fitness, whatever, that doesn't go away. If anything, that needs to get stronger because as we get older, you know, mm -hmm. fatigue sure. sets in a lot quicker. Right. And so that's something yeah. that we have to find. 10 o'clock is a lot ways. harder to get to these days. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's why like the, the way I started off versus where I'm at, it's just, it, it evolves, you know, um, but you just well, got to keep that hustler's mentality. Don't, don't stop the hustle, Sagar. Nay. <laughs> so you, what did you study in undergraduate? Sure. So that, this actually is my father too. So we had a gentleman's agreement that he had to do everything on his own. So he's like, you know, I, I want to support you till you're 21. So I'll pay for your undergraduate as long as you're a doctor, engineer, or computer science. And so <laughs> in, uh, math always came easy to me. And uh -huh. at that time, which is a bad habit, I didn't like to read. I'd avoid it at all costs. So I was like, all right, I guess engineering it is, you know. And so I did bioengineering at UCSD because at the time they were number two in the nation. I was competitive. Like, yeah, if I'm going to do it, might as well pick the hardest major. And then engineering because i knew that's only where my dad was going to pay for my undergrad at ucsd so <laughs> on paper i'm a bioengineer <laughs> and, and you completed it right like you you didn't change to become a social major second quarter no, no. i with with a very colorful 3.0 or it may be there 2999 or 3001 we round up on this program, so yeah. <laughs> i definitely finished and i did engineering out of college 
which is another kind of thing. My first job, I think you asked me like what my first job was. At the time, I don't know if you remember this, Matt, like in 05, market was a little tough um, and we were in a catch 22. And one thing I always did, and I encourage a lot of the youth, especially now is like seek out not quantity, but quality of mentors, older brothers, older sisters, people that you can trust that they have their, the, like a good intention for you. And then ask questions, like, don't be shy. Like they're not going to make time to help you. You've got to seek it out. And that was <laughs> something good- that, right. And that's something that like, I didn't have very many of those people like, you know, around, but as I got older, I started to just, the universe started opening up more of those folks, you know, that I've been lucky to have around me. And one of them was a gentleman by the name of Jay Joseph, who was like my older brother in college. And he was two years ahead of me. He was a bioengineer and he um, saw, saw that there was this, this catch 22, they would graduate with an engineering degree. And then when you have an engineering degree, you apply and they're like, well, you don't have any work experience. And then if you apply for an engineering job, they're like, sorry, you don't have a degree. So it's like, well, what do you want? You want a degree? Do you want work experience? The loophole he found was Boston Scientific, and I'm sure there are other companies, had this internship program where they would pay you hourly, not salary, full-time hours to work as an intern, but you had to be a student. And what they wanted were graduates who were doing a master's uh, engineering at night school. And so what he did was he went to them on an interview and said, listen, Technically, I'm not graduated, so I have student status because he didn't transfer like one of his units. Uh-huh. So he didn't officially graduate UCSD. So he's technically on paper through HR eligible for internship. But he's like, look, I'm basically a graduate and I'm an intern status. So let me work for you guys. So he got that internship job. Two months later, the engineering manager loved him so much. She's like, oh, well, I wish I could just hire you full time. He's like, let me check on that real quick. And then he went and he actually like transferred the unit. And he goes a week <laughs> later, like, look, you see, I give my degree. I can get a full time job. Voila. So, so that was his way of working the system. And again, hustler's mentality. So I took that same internship role two years later and I had him like get me an interview. I'm like, just give me the interview and I'll do it. And so, and people don't know, I actually, my first job, I moved to San Jose for that internship role. The only silly thing I did was the units that I kept I actually had to do it at UCSD. So I couldn't just transfer them over. That was my boneheaded move. And so I did six months in San Ho and I had to come back to UCSD to finish those units up. Um, now I did parlay that because now what happened was that job was still waiting for me. She was like, oh, I wish I could hire you. I'm like, hold that thought three months later, I'll be right back. But then what I did was I hated the Bay I don't know if I've told you this. I'm not, I'm like, a, I'm a SoCal guy. I'm the kind of, Bay is not my, my jam. And so I did not like San Jose. And so I, what I did was before I left, a little hack for those listeners out there that are younger, I went on to the intranet of Boston Scientific. I'm like, like what are the locations do they have? They had Miami and they had LA. I'm like, great cities I'd love to live yeah, in. Yeah, they too. Yeah. So I found out there's an LA division. I took down all the contacts or hiring managers in engineering. And then I hit them all up three months later. And I said, Hey, listen, I got a job offer for engineering in the Bay. Why don't you, if you want, if you sweeten the deal and give me a manager level two, um, engineering level two, I'll join you. And so that's actually how I do my first negotiation to get a higher pay in an engineering job in LA. And that's how I ended up in LA at the Boston Scientific there. Building leverage. Nice, Sagar. Uh, <laughs> But so you, you stayed as an as an engineer your whole career, correct? Not at all. <laughs> you know, you know I didn't. <laughs> so then I did engineering for like I think what like two years, not even. Um, I just got bored. It, it was like I used to have long hair and surf. I had a motorcycle, which sorry, mom and dad, you know, I hid that from them. <laughs> and then um, and I would play pickup basketball. I was living the dream, you know, just nine to five. And then the bug hit me. A um, couple things happened. I think two thousand eight, the market crashed, and you know. I don't want to get too into it just, you know, to protect privacy of my family. But, you know, there are certain things that whatever my dad had worked to kind of get us from nothing to, you know, doing pretty well by the time I got to college, a lot of that kind of, you know, went away, which which like it did for a lot of people in America oh, yeah. who had nothing to do with the market crash. And so he had to almost kind of keep things just afloat. And at this point, you know, me and him had a gentleman's agreement that, hey, after Grand Ivan, you're on your own. To learn to be a man, you must make it on your own. And, you know, to provide his thing was you, as a man, you, your job is to provide and protect. And so I'd already been on my own for two, three years. But when that happened, that's when in my head it was like, okay, it's my job now to be the safety net of my family. And so I need to, you know, really get serious about building an empire. And so 
at that time I was kind of like, okay, dude, this engineering thing, I don't know how far I can take this or not only am I not probably not the best engineer, but I didn't really see a future in getting to where I wanted to. And my vision was always CEO and, and to build companies. So that's when I actually made a move from engineering to marketing. And the only reason I got the job was I literally begged the VP of marketing. She actually, shout out to Mona Patel. She's still one of the best leaders I've ever worked for. And she, I went into her office like, hey, you're Patel, I'm Patel. You can call me janitor, I don't care. But I saw this product manager role available. You don't even have to pay me the same. Just let me on your team. I just want to learn. And it took me three months of lobbying, but eventually they let they said if you interview the whole team and they all agree, we'll let you in. And so I got in as a product manager at 24, 25. I had no business being on the team. It was like freshman on varsity with all these people that were peers that are in their 30s, MBAs from like Harvard, Stanford, engineering from MIT. And I was just like, I, I would sit there every meeting for that first year and they'd say words like PL and I just write down p and what the hell is that? And then go home and Google it. So that that really changed. That was one of the many kind of crossroads for me that changed my trajectory because that exposed me to the entire business side of the entire company because we're interacting with every department. We're pitching in front of the executive team. Um, and then that gave me access actually to the CEO of, of that division who was the ex-VP of sales. He kind of went up from VP to that. And the VP of sales and that CEO took a liking to me because I was always kind of like a go-getter. And that's when um, I got the best advice ever from him. We were at a national sales meeting um, and he was sit sitting right next to me and he turned over at me before he was about to go make his keynote speech. And he goes, so what's up, Sagar? How are you doing these days? And I'm looking at my own good. He's like, what do you want to be, man? What do you want to be a kid when you grow up? And I look him dead in the eye and go, I want to be an effing CEO just like you. And he goes, all right, what are you going to do about it? And I'm like, I don't know, I'm gonna get an MBA. And he's like, listen, kid, shut up. He's like, you see those 10 misfits over there? And they're like these 10 are top 10 reps, like taking shots and stuff. He's like, those 10, you know, mofos are paying the bills for all you cost centers. So he's <laughs> like, if you wanna learn off them. So he's like, if you want to learn to be a CEO, learn how to generate revenue. Go carry the bag. And I kind of never, you know, I, I never turned around from that point on. And that's when I was like, all right, well, give me a job. And he's like, well, that's on you. You got to convince our VP of sales. So I <laughs> begged and begged. And then I went into medical device sales. And then I still happened to, you know, pursue the MBA part-time at USC, which is how we met. But that's the story of how I went from engineering to then marketing as a product manager to then, which helped me understand the full business to then took me to sales. And I've never kind of turned back from, and I've been in the sales side ever since. Nice. Well, one of the things I remember most from our days at Marshall was, gosh, maybe it was a dean. Someone said, I never started working till I was in sales. Uh, yeah. What is your opinion <laughs> on that? I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, be that polarizing. I mean, but I do believe that, man, like everyone should learn sales. I don't know if you recall, that was what I, that was the first year they even offered the art of sales as a elective. And I jumped on that right away. And my passion and something actually I want to look back into even giving forward to SC fight on um, is that at the end of the day, like I just think sales is a, a skill that everyone needs to have in life. You're running late at the airport. You need to cut the line and get in the front. That's sales. You're right. You need to, you know, whatever it is you need to do to convince and influence somebody for better, or for worse, that's sales. I think the problem in sales is that, but previously, it's always been kind of covered by a gray cloud when you associate it with like used car salespeople. But in reality, yeah. you need sales to generate revenue. The question is, is if you have that power, are you going to use it for good and for or for evil? And that's something I'm big on is that, yeah, you sell, but you want to sell the right way and you want to win the right way. And that's something that I've always been kind of big on, like teaching and promoting. And that has to do with like culture. But um, but now, man, sales to me, it, it's a a required skill, I believe, especially if you're going to run a business, it starts with sales. You go on Shark Tank. The first the question they ask is, how much sales do you have? Because if you don't have sales, they can't really invest in you. You don't have right. a product. You don't have a company. So that's kind of why I love USC MBA for that, for that matter. It was so focused. Like if, if you, people took it, if you people picked up on that entrepreneurship program piece of it, it's there's actually a really hard focus on sales. They just weren't branding it as sales, you know? But that's a but but generating revenue is one of the most of the most important pieces, especially when you're starting a company. Interesting. So, so you're a proud, you know, USC Marshall alum, and say you get a phone call, and they're like, Sagar, we saw you on the Matt Balaker podcast. It was amazing. Uh, we know you're too busy to actually teach a course, but maybe you can craft a syllabus that we'll use to teach our students. What two or three points when it comes to sales would be on 
Mr. Patel's or Professor Patel's syllabus. <laughs> well, that might happen sooner than later. I am going to give forward and I, I want to figure out how I can get involved again. Um, number one, understanding your why before you just start trying to sell something and regurgitate. I'm a big believer on you need to know why someone should buy from the owners of the company that you work for or whatever that order or whatever you're selling, because people is the number one secret sauce to anything. It's not really the product. It starts with the people and that people begins with the ownership. So you need to really understand like, why are you working for the owners that you're working for? Then you need to understand, okay, what about the product, the service, the leadership team, right? The people process product. And then the third why is you, because the other day people are purchasing from you. They're trusting you that, hey, you're going to be the right advisor for me to make this purchase correctly. And you're not going to just be a used car salesperson and try to, you know, put me into a car that's going to break down next week, right? You're, in, instead, you're actually going to enable my life to become better because of this purchase. And this is an investment, not a cost. So I think the understanding your whys, I think, is a very important topic. People don't spend enough time figuring out. And then another one I would say is prepare, like, like understanding, like the preparation and the hustle behind it, right. Versus trying to wing it. A lot of people in sales, especially with those who have personality, they'll try to wing it, but that only gets you so far. I and mean, you might get one good year, one good month, one good quarter, but if you want to be good every year after year, like Tom Brady, right. Then you really have to have that muscle of preparation and treat every single day as a brand new day. You're starting at zero, brand new week, brand new month, brand new quarter, brand new year. And I think that starts with just sales training and getting yourself kind of understanding, okay, what's my preparation going to look like on a daily basis? And what, what systematic approach am I going to apply to be successful so that you're not looking at the number every day on the dashboard. You're just focusing on the process. And you know that if you follow the process and you keep adjusting and you're coachable, then you'll, when you look up, you'll be winning, you know? So. Nice. Uh, you mentioned earlier, <laughs> you want to sell the right way. Uh, what do you mean by that? Oh gosh, that's a very loaded question. So I think what that means is it, when you okay, think about this, right? Like in culture, we, when we talk about like, when you establish a culture, there's all kinds of sales cultures. There's a fratty culture. There's that Wolf of Wall Street stuff you see. There's like the Kumbaya where everyone's so nice. You got to walk on eggshells, but then they don't win. And so to <laughs> me, it's a balance, right? Um, and I truly believe that you want to win, but you want to win the right way. And when, so what that means is you want it to be a winning culture where if you're not first, you're last, right? Like Ricky Bobby. But but at the end of the day, you don't want to do it at the cost of integrity and the cost of disrespecting people and at the cost of doing it through negative energy. You want to do it in a manner that lifts everybody up because there's always going to be ups and downs in sales. It's really how you are when it's down. Are you that manager, director, VP, CEO that just you know craps on your people because you're transferring your negative energy and stress onto them? Or are you actually protecting them from that and inspiring them to get up, you know, get together and like work hard towards one mission, one vision. And so I've seen it done right. And, I, and we've done that, you know, in a few, you know, areas and, you know, I've been lucky to be part of. So to me, you know, it's harder to win the right way. That's the reality of it. But when you do it that way, it's actually more sustainable. It's way more fun. And then people want to work with you for you over and over again. And, and that, you know, that's the gift that keeps on giving in a good way. So actually, do you remember how we, met at business school or the or do you remember the story of that or or no i was super I, drunk but yeah no please, please. <laughs> i have some rough ideas so, so i don't know if you remember this this because the reason i bring this up you just reminded me like this whole culture piece right of like winning and winning the right way this kind of had to do with also loosely on my vision for year one at business school because we all had different agendas of why we were there mm -hmm. so when we got to usc do you remember the our program it was three years not two it was nighttime not full-time yeah. and so for us year one we had the same classmates and they were like yo you have one week of icebreakers to pick your project team and that was weird man. Yeah. remember that and, and yeah. it's like for every single class for the entire not quarter the entire year anytime there's a project this is the team you're with right whether you're with them or you're for some people you're stuck with them so now <laughs> do you remember they gave us a piece of paper and on that paper they had like four columns of adjectives like every adjective you could think of like 100 words on there one was like of things you want to look for in in your team member 
It could be like has to get an A or cool getting a B or intelligent, That's hardworking. Right. Do you remember that? And there were like a hundred different like things of like, what do you want? Like what qualities do you want in your teammate, right? To me, this is a perfect exercise of like, are you good at evaluating people and, are, and how do you build teams? And so this is like one of my first like best exercises that I'm proud of actually, um, thanks to you. Uh, and and so uh, please continue. No, no, I'm no, serious. And so, do you remember? Um, do you remember what like what words you circled on that or no? I don't. <laughs> Sorry. So so you know what I did when when we looked at that sheet, people you were supposed to circle five words, and those five words you have to like go around. Oh, hey man, what words did you circle? Intelligence, courage, you know, like and then like you're supposed to try to find like alignment and like what you're looking for. My I circled sense of humor five times. Like literally five times i was like i don't need five things i need one thing sense of humor <laughs> and that's what i was looking for because my mentality was i want to meet four other team members who share a sense of humor because getting an a was not on my agenda yeah. sure i knew we we're gonna be fine but i wasn't there to get an a i was paying for that mba on my own like i need to make sure i learned and digested the stuff that we were learning and i wanted to change the way i saw the world i was trained in engineering and i just got into sales and on the business side so I would watch things like Shark Tank and like people like Mark Cuban's interviews. I'm like, how does he go into the situation and see everything from a business perspective? I'm looking at like, I don't even like, it's like, I don't see how unicorns are popping out of this situation. And so I wanted to change the way I saw the world and rewire myself, the way I saw business people. And so when I came in, I just wanted to learn. I didn't want to be around a bunch of annoying MBAs who are like, well, is that going to be on the test? You know? And so what my thing was like, we're all working professionals. There's going to be times where it'd be two in the morning and we're all going to want to just freaking be done with the project and go work at 6 a.m. At that point, when you're in the foxhole, is are we going to find it enjoyable to work with that person? Are we going to be able to laugh together at 2 in the morning or not? Because if we can laugh together and get through that moment, then we'll for sure you know have a good time. That was my only mentality, brother. And you were a comedian for all. So when I found that you're a comedian, I'm like, this guy has to be on my team. <laughs> and well, that was the, the one time being a comic benefited me, so that I'm, I'm happy it worked out. Uh, that's a that's a cool story. Um, wow. So, what do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions about sales, like from from outsiders who have never sure. worked? Sure. I think people think that number one in sales, it's I don't say sleazy the right word, but they're 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 trying to like con you, right? Right. Right. And, and I think that the whole getting conned is such a misconception. We need people to sell us stuff because a you may not even know that product exists. Number two, if it's the right salesperson, again, keyword, right? And they have integrity and, and the right other qualities, then they're not going to sell you something you don't need because they're looking for every relation they make as a long-term investment. And they'll, they'll treat you like the way they would treat themselves. And so if you have the right advisor, right salesperson in your corner, they're actually going to help you save money in certain situations, actually invest stuff that'll make you more money and give you a better return. And that's why I feel that you need salespeople from a consumer standpoint to help you purchase things correctly if you know how to manage a salesperson and then from a company perspective you need salespeople to generate revenue right so right very cool what are some of the uh most difficult lessons you've had in your career mm -hmm. god so many some of the most difficult lessons um i would say number one this is a tough one assumptions don't make assumptions there's a really good book that i Still to this day, I try to read over every few years called the four agreements. Um, and the, one of the four agreements is don't make assumptions. It sounds simple, but it's so hard. And a lot, or especially early in my career, I wouldn't question things enough. And I would just assume that, oh, yeah, this person walks on water. Oh, this person has an MBA from there. This person worked at Google. They must know everything. And that's something that I had to break and understand like, no, 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 like I have to do my homework. I've got to question things. I've got to like break the assumptions. And that's something that I totally advise people, you know, don't make assumptions. Even with myself, when I work with people, I'm like, hey, don't assume that I know everything, you know, because the right people, they have nothing to hide, right? They're going to be transparent with you. Um, and then the second, you know, thing that was difficult for me to embrace was, um, or that I had to learn was I've never been political, nor will I ever be. I'm too like 100, but I had to learn in my later, like in my early 30s when I got into like management and executive positions that there's a difference between being political and diplomatic. And sometimes it's better to just, you know, not say anything and just wait it out. And then, 
you know, you don't, I don't have to always be on the offense, you know, I'm trying to protect everybody. And that was something that took me time to learn. Yeah. That, no, that's a, that's a very mature outlook because there's a tendency, especially for, you know, quote unquote, good managers to want to fix everything. And that usually requires involvement. And sometimes the best thing to do is just let people be, you know, so it's like yeah. my wife's pissed. Sometimes just let her like be, be alone <laughs> for a while. And then, then I'll, approach her in a week or so and things things will be fine <laughs> that's probably where i need advice is on the personal <laughs> side because i can probably apply a lot of these business you know concepts in the personal end so that's, okay that's a, lo a longer podcast well <laughs> one because you're, you're here and I, I don't i don't mean to put you on the spot but i've i've looked on youtube a few times and said so i have this pen you know and they always say like sell me the pen and i've actually never seen a, a good answer to it I've, I've watched probably a dozen videos on it and i'm not asking you to like sell me this pen Sagar, but it's kind of a cliche but i think there's something to it like what what is the purpose of that exercise and, and what do you think is a good way to sell the pen yeah you know i think it's that concept is too linear i think the world isn't just x and y <laughs> there's a, there's a z access too yeah. so every situation is unique are there going to be situations where you know how to where you need to know how to sell the pen absolutely right but again, it goes back to the assumption. I don't want to assume that I know all the 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 data. So the first thing I would want to know is I want to understand the situation. Okay, where are we? Who am I talking to? Like, what's your personal goals? Because the better you understand your audience or your customer or whoever that is, I need to also know the person asking me the question about the pen. Is, are they even a customer? Do I even care about this person? Because I don't. My question, my my answer is like I don't even. I don't need to give you an answer. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but but in reality, I, I always put the question back on to the other side of, okay, you tell me, you know, because it's 80-20 rule, right? Especially in sales, early the earlier you are in the process, the less you want to speak, the more you want to listen, because the answers are in front of you. And the more you can listen and dig and, and find out more information, the better you can then figure out, okay, what's the right, number one, what is the right problem we're trying to so, so, solve? Because sometimes people are solving the wrong problem. And then you can start to understand, okay, what's the best strategy to collaborate right and what are the right people to get in the room to find the right solution for that problem because that'd be arrogant for me to also think that i just know the answer right a lot of times you need multiple people to get their minds together and create that collaborative situation to then solve for that problem these are the things i think that are being lost today with technology technology is great it's amazing for efficiency but the part that you have to still keep is that human touch and the that whole that the magic that comes out of collaborating you can't hide behind a screen. You can't just work in silos and just work on something alone, throw over the fence, da da da. That that only takes you so far. A lot of the magic is getting in a room with an ambiguous situation, not knowing what the right answer is, and being able to navigate a conversation or conversation and discussions to go through that journey together and guide that group and shepherd them towards one goal. And then at the end of the meeting, you're like, oh wow, look what we just came up with. And that that is a again a wired skill that takes time and a muscle to develop and people are losing that muscle because the more they people don't want to be confrontational or even just like want to like work with people live i think they're losing that and that's where you know you lose innovation right well i think that was the best answer to the how to sell the pen <laughs> so well, this will be on youtube so i expect it to be the best one that. and well and i you said a lot of important things but i think what stands out to me the most was really I'm summarizing, but it's not about you. It's not about the salesman. It's not about the salesperson. It's about understanding who you're talking to. And you brought that up pretty quickly. And I think that was sort of the crux of it. It's like that book influence. It's a very popular, I don't know if you call it a sales book, but I'm sure a lot of salespeople read it. But yeah, one yeah. of the through lines is that it's like, spend more time listening and knowing who you're talking to than pitching. Because rarely, this was an example from the book, is someone going to hang up the phone if they're talking? But if someone's just like talking a mile a minute and trying to like present something that they may or may not need, you're just like, yeah, this is getting annoying. And then you're gonna you're gonna hang up. So. You hit the nail on the head, and that's something that I was challenged with, especially in my younger days, because a lot of times my passion would be taken for like I'm speaking at somebody when in reality, no, I'm just passionate, and I probably have some form of ADD or ADHD where it's like my mind just won't stop spinning. And so learning how to control that and like slow down and, and, and be, you know, more intentional with every word I say and with pauses and time, it just, it, it's still a work in progress for me, but that's exactly it. Now, 
there's the thing that's helped me is the intention. My intention has always been that 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 uh, the, the intention has always been to learn about the other person and also understand their perspective. And so that's helped me stay true north. But I had to like also fix some of these like traits. And that's another thing on the sales side. I think is if you really are a a high value um, sales professional then you truly care about understanding what the other person's perspective is and not just that person, but everyone in the rooms. And then as you move up in the, right, in just in leadership, your goal isn't to get your point across. It's actually to understand everyone's perspective in the room and get all these individuals who have their individual agenda to move in one direction. And I will say on a personal level, that gets exhausting because if for a profession, all you're doing is trying to understand everyone's perspective. And once in a while, you're like, does anybody want to know freaking my perspective? <laughs> like, nah, not really. Right? And so then that's where in the personal life that comes, becomes a challenge where sometimes I want someone to actually try to give a, you know, give a damn about what the hell I think, you know, but. Well, you're always welcome on this podcast because we give a damn about what, <laughs> what you think. Yeah, man. So how would you respond to the old sales adage that, I don't take no for an answer. Oh man, that's again, it's too linear. It's, it's, it, it depends on the situation, right? Like sometimes that question or, or that person where they're coming from, what they think is a no isn't a no. And so you don't even have to even agree on it. It's really just understanding, okay, what's the no or what's the situation. But for, for me, it's not about, um, trying to solve world hunger on one day. That's, <laughs> that's really enterprise sales, right? It's learning how you live to see the next day. And sometimes you have to actually think about it from a chess, not checkers perspective. Like, okay, we're trying to solve for a multi-million dollar deal, not just to like 5K, 10K, 50K, right? So like in my career, um, not to go backwards here, but like I've had the privilege of working. I started a medical device, right? I was so lucky, number one, that the first leadership team that I ever worked for, like at Boston Scientific, was probably if not the best like they they set the level so high in terms of gold standard of what true leadership means from a cohesion standpoint having the the trifecta of iq eq and character like mm -hmm. you have to have iq but you also have to have really high eq i think is even more important and then the third that people overlook is character how are you when no one is watching when it comes to business are you putting the business before your selfish needs and are you truly selfless they embodied that and i learned that and that stuck with me ever since. And so having that as an example and my gold standard, then also my first sales job being in my humble opinion, top of the totem pole, hardest sales job in, in healthcare, which is medical device sales. I don't know if you remember, I was doing brain and spine surgery, surgery cases, and that humbled me too. So after that, I've been able to then work in almost every subsector of healthcare, whether it's enterprise, working with payers, providers, working in home care, um, selling the small practices, doing SaaS, um, behavioral health, right? And so doing all these little categories and subsectors of healthcare, I've seen that there isn't like a one size fits all. In every situation, it's different. And so when you're dealing with a long sales cycle with a big dollar amount, you need to know what your next five steps are. And I think that's the key is that sometimes it's not about the yes or the no, it's understanding the situation and what's best and how you educate them step by step. And so that's kind of, you know, that's been a really fun, you know, a, a challenging, but fun experience of learning, you know? Nice. And how, how is work life different now that, you know, it's your own business versus working for someone else? Yeah. The million dollar question. So, I mean, I don't know if I told you, right. So after business school, I moved to New York, switched to tech. I got selected for one of those rotational leadership programs at IBM. I got lucky. And they uh, had me move to New York, though, for it. And so that's changed my trajectory. I switched to tech in 2012, worked at IBM, got my training, and then I left for startups and been in startups ever since. Um, I helped two startups scale in New York. And then by that point, you know, this is like six years ago, I got to this pro point in my career. I'm like, you know, I can get a VP of sales job anywhere, but if family is really my number one most important, you know, priority, and my younger sister got married and moved to San Francisco. I knew my parents would be alone in OC. So that's why I moved back. I moved back. I started my consulting company, Ocean Calm, um, as a side hustle. Um, it was a great way to like evaluate people. One of my mentors like, yo, listen, you're going to get hit up by all of these companies, but 1% of them are real. The other 95 are complete frauds. And so what's a good way to interview them? Do a consulting project for 90 days. I'm like, it's like, then you get to evaluate them. 
just so much. And I'm like, that's smart. And so that's how the genesis of my consulting started six years ago. As I did that, I got recruited to the third startup that I worked with called Honor. They were in the Bay Area. At the time, they were a Series B, 100 employee-ish. They wanted to pivot from D to C to B to B. So they brought me on board to kind of help build out the B to B team. And then four years later, two which were during COVID, we went from Series B to Series E, like valued at $1.25 billion, which is they call the unicorn in startups. Yeah. And so having go, going through that amazing journey of four years with that company um, also, you know, kind of changed my life, you know, or, or it was a game changing opportunity. And so when that have, when that journey completed, that's when I kind of asked myself, like, what do I really want to do? And if my true purpose is to impact as many lives, as many owners, as many employees, as many people out there, then working for one company, I'm not doing myself or the universe justice. And so I thought rather than just advising one company on the side, which is what I was doing, why not advise four or five? And that's where I went full time on my own into OceanCom like in 2022, two and a half years ago. I did that for a year or two, learned a lot. I mean, in the beginning, I, I was so paranoid. Like, I don't, I hate losing more than I love winning. So I was taking all kinds of crazy jobs. And then I realized money's not everything. And what my real purpose is, is I want to start by helping my own people first and people that I know, personal, professional, or people that I may not know, but that refer to me who have the the IQ, the EQ, but the character. Like, I want to help the, the, the people that deserve the help. Um, and that's when I started kind of redoing my book of business. And then I actually um, started thinking like, how do I scale this? Because just as a solo you know, consultant, it's like hard. Time is the currency, right? And I'm running out of time. That's when I realized I need to take a step back to move too forward. I need to invest in people and hire some really smart people. And I got really lucky that some of my favorite people in life all agreed and wanted to join and be part of this movement. And so a year ago, we, you know, less than a year, we started forming this uh, consulting group. and. Um, that's why like, it's, it's different, man. There are no sick days. Like I, you know, when it's your own business, it's 24 yeah. seven, um, you eat, breathe, sleep it like you, I actually look up to you a lot. You've been, you've been a trailblazer, man, in terms of putting yourself out there, being authentic and just not waiting like for perfection and just doing, cause it, it turns into perfect. Like even your, your comedy circuit, like this podcast, you've always just, like just jumped into the deep end and that's what took me so long to do. And I finally done is now I'm putting out content and just, you know, putting it out there just because if it can help one person, it was worth it. And that's been the hardest unlock for me in terms of being uncomfortable with that. And my newest uncomfort is, you know, posting, you know, content. You're a content creator as well. Very cool. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, what are you most proud of when it comes to your um, career? I would have to say, being self-made like i'm proud that and again i'm so thankful and indebted to my parents for supporting me till i was 21 um till end of undergrad right um and i didn't have any debt i get to start at zero which is a huge blessing and which is why i sure. it's my responsibility to be their safety net and why i move back to oc to make sure you know they're not taken care of they can retire get get all their stuff in order um but I am proud that since that day, though, everything I've done has been on my own. And whether it took me a little bit longer than others to buy a home or make investments and build a diverse portfolio, get real estate investments, an angel investment or two, finally, you know, like I've been doing it organically, but um, that organic, slow and steady way and not cutting corners, I am very proud of that because I know that that is sustainable versus trying to like, cut, you know, take shortcuts because there are no shortcuts to success. Right. Right. Your, your dad definitely taught you to fish <laughs> oh, and your and mom. Let's I don't know, yeah, I've got to give her credit. It takes two to tango. Uh, what are you two. most optimistic about? I am very optimistic about what types of partnerships, projects we're going to take on at Ocean Farm Advisory Group, the, the, the types of people that are going to work with us. I just know it's going to turn into very impactful businesses, not just for the patients and the consumers, but even for the providers involved in it. And then also for the employees that are involved. People forget that when you build a business or businesses and you grow businesses and you employ more people, and if you're winning, and like you said, that we're at, right, winning the right way and you're creating a positive culture, 
people look back and, they, and you ask them, what was the best company you worked for? What was the job you worked for? That's the goal, right? Is for any company that comes in our, you know, in, under our wing, we want to be part of that type of a, a journey and a mission. And so that's what I'm most excited for is that the more people that we can reach out to and, and have connected to us and work with, for those people that have such a positive just experience, and it's going to lead to more opportunities of working together in other in other ventures. Nice. And where can people learn more about you, what you're up to? You know, they're yeah. watching this, they want to talk to you. How do they do that? Sure. So I'd love to talk to all the people out there that, you know, are interested in wanting to learn more and even just make a good connection. Uh, we are, our website is www.oceancom, calm like the ocean. So ocean, C-A-L-M dot C-O. You can hit us up on there on our contact us page. You can check us out on oceancom01, which is our LinkedIn. I mean, our, sorry, our, it is our LinkedIn and our Instagram. And then I also have a YouTube channel where I put out content. And again, in the short term, we're partnering with, you know, healthcare and tech startups and small businesses who do anywhere from one to 20 million in sales that want to grow. Because when you're a small company, you've got to grow. However, the future of OceanCom is I'll be building an angel fund, right? I get a lot of friends, family who want to sometimes just invest in what I'm investing in. So mm -hmm. again, this isn't something I'm trying to make a big public thing, but for anybody else that's associated with us that wants to be involved in small projects, medium projects, angel investments that I'm doing personally or, or OceanCom is doing, that's something I'm excited about that we're going to build out to give people access that don't have that kind of access to the VCs of the world. And yeah, and then that's just, again, the tip of the iceberg. There's going to be so many more opportunities for people to get involved um, working with us. Very cool. Well, I know you have a wedding to attend, so thank you for your time. And Sagar Patel, really appreciate it. Matt, it's a pleasure, man, and a privilege. Thank you so much for having me, buddy. I'm really proud of you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Matt Balaker podcast. To learn more, please check out mattbalaker.com and encourage your friends to like, subscribe, and share. Really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.